project that we've been working with. We've been working with um, the folks in New Hampshire, Phil Brown, with for a couple of years now. So uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about Hawk Mountain, but I'm happy to answer questions later or encourage you guys to go to our website to learn more about what's going on here and all the opportunities to visit and see what's, see some raptors here along the ridges. Okay, so how do I get this to advance? Interesting. All right, there. Um, okay, well, this is the view most of us have of broadwing hawks. If you're a bird watcher, you step outside during the fall period or, or mid spring and you see a flock of uh, swirling bee-like creatures above in the sky and, and we all get excited because these are the, our harbinger, harbingers of spring and the returning and harbingers of fall as well when they pass through in September. At Hawk Mountain, broadwing hawks are the most numerous migrant that we see. Uh, we count up to 13,000 usually each fall season, uh, which is more than half or, or about half of all the migrants that we see at Hawk Mountain. So they're a pretty important bird at Hawk Mountain as well as at many other sites. Well, what do we know about broadwing hawks? Or what do, what, what do we know basic biology um, as bird watchers we can go to eBird or to All About Birds at Cornell, and we, we can learn, we can see that these birds are long distance migrants. They're migrating from places all throughout the Eastern North America and uh, as far west as Western Canada. And they migrate down mostly into Central and South America for the winter. Uh, they are a forest nesting bird, so they are found primarily in forest as well. And they are kind of a small stocky raptor about the size of a crow. They have these broad white, black and white tail bands that are very distinctive on the adults and this dark trailing edge. And they have a very distinctive call that you may hear when you're out in the forest around Maine when you're listening to the, to the birds in the forest, you may hear this high pitched keer whistle, which is very distinctive. Uh, at attribute of the broadwing hawk. Of course, one of the other really amazing things about broadwings is that they build, their flocks build in size as they go south. So when you get down to Texas or Mexico, you may see flocks that look like this, which are really uh, awesome, um, awe-inspiring sights. And one wonders, you know, what is going on and how these birds are behaving and and how are they uh, moving through uh, the continent in such large numbers? So they are what we call a long distance migrant. They're also a complete migrant, which means they nearly all of the broadwing hawks that nest throughout their breeding range leave that breeding range for a very distinct wintering area. Uh, so they're very conspicuous in migration and concentrated. These are just some examples at Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania our peak flight ever in our 90 year history is 22,000 in one day. But if you go up along the Great Lakes, such as Hawk Ridge, Minnesota, you could have up to 100,000 birds pass in a day. And as you move south, that number grows and grows. In Texas, it, they can have up to half a million. And then in Veracruz River Raptors down in Mexico, 800,000 is, is a possible one day count for broadwings. So it's fairly amazing. Uh, bird in migration and very conspicuous. Their timing is very uh, constrained in time. So when they're moving through these large numbers, a lot of them are passing through a certain area within a mostly within one week's time period. But when you look at broadwing hawks in the other parts of the year, like the nesting season, they're very inconspicuous. Like you can see in this bird here, perching in, in the forest, they're, other than that high-pitched whistle, which they use occasionally, they can be very, very difficult to spot. So why did we decide to study them? Well, first of all, as I said before, they're one of the most conspicuous migrants and most numerous migrants in Eastern North America, but they're also a species that has shown some regional declines. And these are data points uh, that represent trends at, at watch sites or hawk watch sites all across the United States and Canada, 
and some in, in Mexico. And the, anywhere where the blue circle is a, is a site that's showing stable counts of broadwing hawks. But the, bur the sites which have red arrows are places where we're seeing declines in the migrating counts of those birds. And you can see that here in Eastern North America, there's a cluster of these red arrows, which cause uh, concern if you're interested in conservation of these species. If we zoom in on those red arrows, uh, you can see it almost looks like they're mostly concentrated in the eastern part of the migration area. So east of the Appalachian Mountains is where we're seeing the, the highest uh, proportion of these declining counts. So it's because of these declining counts on migration and also on the breeding grounds. These are some data um, comparing breeding bird atlas projects, which have been done more than once. So the, and looking at whether there's a change in the number or the, ex the extent of the breeding range for the broadwing hawk. And you can see anywhere in red in this area from of Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, are areas which are showing uh, de declines in the probability of seeing broadwing hawks. So Southern Pennsylvania, um, Eastern Ohio are big areas where we're seeing declines in broadwing hawks. So because of these declines in, in migration and in breeding season, we decided we, we wanted to do a full life, life cycle study of the broadwing hawk. And Hawk Mountain was founded in 1934 by Rosalie Edge and her one of her big um, statements that we use as a motto for a lot of our work here is that the time to save a species is while it's still common. And that just makes sense that it, if we just ignore these, these little declines and hope they'll go away, then they become bigger declines and then turning them around becomes a lot harder. So we started in 2014, the Broadwing Hawk Project here in Pennsylvania and Hawk Mountain. We received a grant uh, from the state of Pennsylvania for two years. Uh, I was able to hire um, Rebecca McCabe who conducted her master's degree on Broadwing Hawks and then has stayed on with the project is now working here full time. She uh, received her PhD working on snowy owls a couple of years ago. So um, for the last 10 years, we've been working on broadwing hawks consistently and conducting what we call a full life cycle study. And what does that mean? That means that we, we wanna know what's going on with the bird uh, during the breeding season, the mi fall migration, the winter, as well as the spring migration. And the reason for this is we don't really know at what point in the life cycle these birds may be um, impacted. So we wanna understand what kinds of conservation threats they're facing all throughout their life cycle. Well, if you think about the, um, uh, before I say that, I would like to acknowledge this kind of study when you're talking about um, working throughout the life cycle for a long distance migrant, it takes a lot of effort. Um, and so I just wanna thank a lot of the people that have been involved um, in the project, including the Harris Center for Environmental Education where Phil Brown works. So originally our first four or five years, we worked exclusively in Pennsylvania and we were a lot of the results I'm gonna be talking about today or some of the results are uh, based on a lot of the data collected in Pennsylvania. But more recently, we've expanded um, north and into different areas of the nesting range. And the reason for that is that it could be that um, the pressures faced in one part of the range may be different than those in, in other parts of the breeding range. So we wanted to try to look at birds from different areas. And also we wanted to study their migration to see if they might be wintering in different areas or the timing could be different for the migrants from different areas or or a whole, whole, whole host of different uh, differences could be occurring from when birds are from different parts of the range. So how do we study broadwing hawks during the breeding season? Well, one of the first things we have to do is go out in the woods in the spring and try to find nests. And so we walk around in the woods, we're scanning the trees, looking for something like this that you see up in the upper right here, a bunch of sticks in the crotch of a tree. That's the beginning of a broadwing hawk nest. And of course, we're looking for the birds as well. We look for areas where the birds are hanging out. Uh, the male and female might be calling back and forth and that gives us a cue that, that they, we may be near a nest. And then later on we return and we hope to see something like this in early May where a bird is actually perched or, or incubating uh, a little nest here. Broadwings don't build a real complicated nest. It's often kind of ramshackle like you see here. 
And then of course, um, nests can be difficult to find. You can see here's three different nests, photographs of three different nests. And you can see that if you were walking through the woods that you might just walk right by and not notice this, this nest over here or this nest over here. So they can be highly secretive. And then later on, we go back and visit the nests and we find um, and we confirm whether they fledged young, how many young have been produced, and then uh, proceed to take measurements on the nest site itself. Particularly in Pennsylvania, we've been we've done quite a bit of studies on the the attributes of the nest, what, what trees they're using, um, how big the trees are, and uh, we also collected data using cameras on a couple, several nests to look at what the birds were eating and other behaviors. Here's a, at the bottom you can see the, a bird holding a chipmunk in its talons. Over here, a bird is, uh, has a bit of nest material in its bill. And then there's some chicks on a nest here that would, were photographed using a camera. So our study period begins primarily in, for the nesting season, begins in April and goes through July. Uh, during these period, we studied um, what the birds were eating, and we found out that the primarily primary prey item is small mammals, a whole mi mix of different things from mice to chipmunks to shrews. They also will take small birds, often nestlings for nests, and then they do eat quite a bit of snakes and frogs and insects. We also, our observations on the nests um, with cameras and with our with um, observers watching the nests for, for the diurnal period, discovered a very important thing that has conservation implications. And that is that when, after the nestlings hatch out of the eggs, the parents uh, reduce the amount of time that they spend at the nest after the first week. So if you look at the proportion of daylight hours, the, the daylight period that the adults are at the nest, in the first week of life, they're, they're there a lot. They're up to 70% of the daylight hours. There's at, one of the, one, at least one parent at the nest. But right after that, it drops dramatically. And by the third week of life, nestlings are, are left alone pretty much for most of the day. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that both parents are needed to run or to fly around and try to find prey to keep these guys fat and happy. So um, it's a trade-off that the broadwings are using is they're, they're putting their resources and their parental care into finding food, but at the same time, that leaves these young birds exposed in the nest to things like predation. As far as nest trees, uh, broadwing hawks primarily are using a wide variety of trees, uh, oftentimes the, one of the larger trees in the stand. Uh, we found them in both evergreen trees, white pines, hemlocks, chestnut trees, tulip trees, birch, and, and on. Um, they average about two fledglings for each nest, although we've had as many as four. And uh, the nests, nests are usually in the top third of the tree, about 50 feet high. When we look at what kinds of habitat broadwing hawks are using, it's primarily forest. 82% of the area around a nest site is forested, and 9% uh, are wetlands. And this is front data from from Pennsylvania only. We're looking forward to adding some of the other nest sites from New England to our data set. Um, but the proportion of wetlands around the nest and the proportion of evergreen forest, 26%, is much higher than you see normally in the Pennsylvania forest. So uh, they seem to like those lower elevation mesic areas, which have a little bit of mixed evergreen and deciduous forest. Now, one of the things we've been doing to try to better study our breeding birds is to uh, capture them and ban them. And uh, we're, we're using telemetry, but we're also, for those birds that we don't have telemetry units on, we're using uh, color bands that then we trap them once and then we can follow them and see if they return year after year, which is helpful in trying to un understand survival and return rates of the adults. And you can see a band on the leg of each of the birds in these photos here. So once a bird is banded, even if they don't have a color band, we can usually figure out if it's a returning bird. Now, this is just an example of the kind of data we can collect with banded birds. Um, these, this is a pair of birds, Paula and Brune, who we, we've tagged the male in 2014 and the female a little bit later, but she was very distinctive. So we're confident they were together that whole time. And um, 
we've been following them now for the full 10 years of the study. And I just put numbers here to show you all the different nest sites that they used. Broadwing hawks do not return to the same nest every year. They build a new nest, which makes it challenging if you're trying to study them. But the interesting thing about um, these, this pair here is they've stayed together for this entire 10 year period. They return every year and they've moved around kind of in this little circle. So the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year, then they moved across the road, sixth year, seventh year, eight, nine. And then last year they returned to the same tree they used 10 years ago. So we're hopeful that they're just gonna follow this circle around and make our lives easier in terms of trying to find the nest. But it's great to be able to, to study uh, birds that you've been monitoring for a long period of time and really get to understand their biology. This is a, a photograph of Rosalie who is, who is trapped at Hawk Mountain. And you can see all her movements over a three year period. She had a, a satellite unit on her that lasted about three years. Um, but we are still able to see her uh, bands uh, more recently. So she's been returning for at least four to six years now. And one of the things that we've been able to find about breeding, nesting broadwing hawks by putting these transmitters on them is how large are their nesting or breeding range. And this is a uh, summary of data, 18 female birds on the left and four male birds on the right. And what you can see is that the size of the breeding home range is about 10 times uh, larger for the male compared to the female. The female tends to stay very close to the nest during the nesting season, but the male, he's really always foraging. So he's traveling far and wide trying to find prey for the female when she's incubating eggs, but also for the young after they hatch. And this is what a breeding home range looks like uh, year after year, the different colors or the different years. Um, so this is three years of a, a, a nesting bird and over here is three years and here's two years. This bird here is from New Hampshire. This is a male. And these other three are females. So uh, the key factor here is to show you that the home range doesn't shift that much between years. Occasionally it gets bigger, but for the most part, the birds are using the same area year after year. They're moving their nest around a little bit, but it's always within that core area. So they're highly faithful to their breeding sites. Once they have a territory and a nest, they come back year after year, unless they don't survive. Okay, the other um, aspect of our research was to try to understand their migration and their wintering, period. Well, in order to do that, we're, for these long distance migrants that are migrating down to South America is we need to use uh, satellite telemetry. So this is a photograph of a satellite telemetry unit that was that had been placed on a bird. You can see it sitting on the back of the bird. It's attached in a backpack with a very fine uh, Teflon ribbon, which is very smooth. So it doesn't cause any abrasions on the bird's feathers or on the skin. And it can, it can stay on the bird for a couple of years. And it gives us very uh, precise locations on where the bird was along migration as well as in the winter. So you may say, well, how do we get these birds? I'm going to do a real quick uh, demonstration of, of that. Uh, we have, uh, whoops, we have um, these very fine mist nets that we hang up, uh, we put below a nest site. Once we've located a nest, we, we put some net, nets up and we sit in a blind uh, with our, our binoculars. And then we, we, we have this guy here, who's our uh, field assistant. Uh, we put him out next to the mist nets and we have a, a remote control, um, remote control in the, um, inside the blind that we can use to, um, to make the owl move. And then we also play a call of young owls or adult owls. And hopefully you can see, we're looking out the blind window here. You can see the owl is moving his wings. And that gets the broad wings very upset because great horned owls are predators. So if they see a great horned owl near their nest, they're gonna want to, to scare it away. And we play the owl call to get their attention. Um, so then what happens next hopefully is uh, while the bird, the bird is getting angry at this owl is hopefully it gets caught in the net. And that's what happened right there. And took the owls, the owl's head off too. 
So that's how we trapped the uh, the the uh, broadwing hawk. It's not 100% effective. We get them about 30 to 40% of the time. Sometimes they're too smart or they don't come down low enough to get caught in the net. But once they're caught, we do all kinds of measurements and uh, study their their molt. And then we, we put um, color bands on the birds so we don't have to trap them again and release them. And if they're big enough, we put a transmitter on. Usually only transmitters have been put on females. We do have a couple of smaller transmitters that went on the males. Uh, but um, as you know, in raptors, females are larger, so they're much more apt to be able to carry a transmitter. Uh, the transmitters are quite small. They're about nine grams. You can see one here. More recently, we've been using this transmitter style here, which is um, doesn't ping off of a satellite, but pings off of cell towers. And then it downloads the data. Uh, if it's not near a cell tower, it just stores the data, the location data on the bird, and eventually it downloads it when it gets near a, to a, a tower. So what happens oftentimes then is, is in the winter time, we don't, when they're down in the jungles of the Amazon, we don't hear from them for a while, but then when they start moving north, we get a whole bunch of data on where they were for the winter. And this is what a, a transmitter looks like when it's on the back. It's very small, it has a little solar panel, which allows it to recharge uh, over the winter. So, so far we have put out about 27 different uh, transmitters from different locations from as far north as Quebec, down south through Pennsylvania. We put on five in New Hampshire so far. And this past summer, we put one on Vermont. Uh, we're hoping to go back to both Quebec and Vermont to put on two more transmitters each site this coming summer. Only three males, uh, which means we only had three transmitters that were small enough to put on a male. So what have we been learning about broadwings from this uh, radio, from the satellite tracking? Well, first of all, some of the interesting data is the first couple of years, we did track a couple of juveniles, like first year birds. And you can see almost immediately that the juveniles didn't migrate as far as the adults. They were much, much shorter migration than the adults. Uh, and I should say there's a couple of lines here from Alberta. There are three broad wing hawks that were tagged by the Smithsonian. So we've mapped here as well. But the important thing is that most of the adults went into central, most, most of the adults went past Central America into South America, whereas most juveniles stayed farther north. As far as departure dates, um, Pennsylvania birds mostly left in late August, whereas Alberta birds tended to leave a little bit later in early September. Um, and then when we look at how fast the birds were traveling, Alberta birds traveled very fast, the fastest through the central United States, whereas Pennsylvania birds were traveling fastest through Northern Mexico. The fastest is about 150 miles in a day. So it's not uh, maybe as fast as some people might have suspected. They, these are soaring birds, so they're moving fairly slowly. When broadwing hawks take about uh, 90 days to go from breeding site to wintry site. So if, and then it's another almost 90 days to return in the spring. So they're spending about six months of the year in migration. And for adults, the distance they're moving can be up to 7,000 miles, whereas the juveniles appear to be migrating much shorter. Um, all of the birds have very synchronous migration, it appears. We're starting to add to this data set, but uh, New Hampshire birds, for example, came through mostly in the second week of October, whereas Pennsylvania birds were mostly in the last part of September. Here's a compilation map of, of all the Pennsylvania birds and the Alberta birds before we started tagging in New Hampshire. And you could see that, uh, the, at least for the Alberta birds, there appeared to be a little bit of a pattern of them going more into the northeastern part of South America, whereas our Pennsylvania birds were kind of scattered through the um, more southwestern or the northern part of, of South America, but not as far east. So that gave us a suggestion that maybe there was some migration connectivity or, <coughs> excuse me, differences between the areas, the breeding areas. As far as where birds wintered, we found birds wintering in 10 different countries, Mexico, south through Bolivia, 
then when we were able to follow them for more than one year, they tended to return to the same wintering areas. So they're showing high fidelity to their breeding areas and high fidelity to their wintering areas. Now here's some, bird, some data from New Hampshire and Connecticut birds and one Ontario bird in green. And you can see that we're seeing a pretty similar pattern of spread, spread in uh, wintering areas between the, the different area, between the different, um, excuse me, <coughs> a little bit of a tickle. I guess the key point I'm trying to make is that there's not a big difference between where the birds are coming from. We're seeing kind of a similar spread in where they're wintering as we saw with the Pennsylvania birds when we look at some of these um, birds from Canada, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. But this is something we're going to be looking at more in the next couple of years. But um, here's an example of an individual's movement. This is a bird called CU Home. It was named by the donors. It nested in Connecticut. And these are two years of migration data. The bird went down in 2021 and wintered in uh, at the border of Colombia and Venezuela. There's kind of a, a, a zoomed in look here and then migrated back north. And then in, in this last year, it migrated down into the same area. It returned to the exact same wintering area, but inter inter interestingly, it didn't take the same path necessarily. So, so they're, even though they're wintering in the same area, they may have a slightly different migration path. And this is a bird that has gone down and returned. Uh, we, we actually have the, more of the return data now, but uh, this is Hugger from Canada. We seem to be returning on the same pathway as she went down. And she wintered uh, a little farther north than a lot of the other adults. As she, she wintered in this uh, somewhat um, urbanized area around Guatemala City. And this is a map of uh, Muskoka, who migrated down to, to Brazil. Um, and one of the interesting things about Muskoka was that she might came down to a uh, wintering site in Brazil um, and then started wandering into Bolivia. And we wondered if, if, if her movements, if she would have stopped in Brazil if she hadn't encountered the deforestation that was going on in that area of Brazil. And if we zoom in on it, we can see that this is some deforestation data from a site called Forest Global Forest Watch. And this area in, in the square here is where she would have been, she first landed in that first year. And then she started wandering more into this green area. So we, we, do, we have seen several birds that have returned to their, to, to wintering areas and uh, after there's been some cutting and see, we've seen mostly uh, wandering or moving away from that area. Let's see, this is, um, I'm gonna skip. This is, um, this is a bird from New Hampshire, um, two birds from New Hampshire. One was Thelma. They nested uh, very close together, what, but different nest sites, not, they weren't paired together in 2021, but the interesting thing is that they ended up in, in vastly different areas of South America. Uh, nor, the, the Harris, the one in pink, was uh, wintered farther north in Colombia, whereas Thelma ended up in Brazil. Uh, Harris reached his, his wintering grounds in Colombia on the 25th of October, but Thelma spent a, a whole nother month in migration and and went down to Brazil. So we're seeing quite a variety of different patterns. Uh, but for, if you do a, a little circle around all the Pennsylvania adults, you can see that they're mostly nesting in this north northwestern sector of South America. And the New Hampshire, Ontario birds are, are somewhat following that same area, maybe a little bit more to the east. Uh, now, some of our broad wings that we we marked from Pennsylvania have wintered very close together, but also but in opposite to what I showed you about those two New Hampshire birds, they nested hundreds of miles apart, but on their wintering grounds are only about 85 miles apart. So we're seeing both patterns. This is an area of southern Peru where three different females from Pennsylvania wintered. 
So we're seeing high winter site fidelity um, when we've been able to get repeat uh, tra trips on, on a bird, they end up returning to the same area. And this is uh, Harris from New Hampshire. He's, he's using exactly the same area of Northern Columbia. There's some photographs of his wintering area. It's highly, very rough topography, a lot of, uh, Okay, so some of the other things that we're uh, learning about their migration is uh, not only where they're they're wintering and how their path their path through the through the migration route, but some of the challenges they might be encountering as well. This is a zoomed in shot of of two birds that were returning to Canada, Ontario, and they came up a little bit farther. Uh, west then they went down on migration so they they both flew up north in illinois and they hit lake michigan over here and then went up the the, the far side of, of the of the lake then one of them the one in red here uh figured out what was going on turned around and went back south and then kind of tried to go north again hit this lake lake on her on and then eventually was able to find a way to get back to ontario but um, the other bird spent up almost uh, a week, two weeks roaming around this lake shore of Lake Michigan, trying to figure out a way to cross, tried to cross this area, then turned around and went farther into Wisconsin, and then finally went around the north side of the lake. But it was a little bit painful to watch her progress because she kept, she would not go to, go to the south like the other bird and figure out a way to cross there, she kept trying to go up the lake shore. We studied their wintering areas a little bit and we're finding that there are some uh, patterns that most of the habitat that the birds are using are these large forested areas, what we call submontane, lowland, evergreen, uh, tropical forests. And a lot of these areas are threatened by deforestation and forest fires and mining. They're not all being heavily threatened, some of it's just light threats, but it is, there is human threats occurring in these areas. Um, some of the threats the birds are facing on migration, we uh, know firsthand from some of the Hawk Mountain trainees that are working in Columbia and other places uh, where they're actively shooting migrating birds, such as these Swainson's Hawk that you see here. Um, and also because broadwing hawks are forest birds, we, we're wondering if they need forest on their migration to stop and rest and feed and how that might impact them. So we're starting to try to look at habitat use in winter migration and nesting periods. Um, this is just an example of what a stopover might look like for a bird. This is one of the juveniles that was tagged. We spent about 10 days wandering around this southern area of Mexico and you can see clearly that they're moving around, probably trying to feed during that period. So stopovers are probably fairly important to these birds and being able to find uh, good patches of forest where they can find food and rest uh, and uh, get ready for their next journey. We've, sun we've seen some fidelity when we've been able to track birds for multiple years to some of the stopover sites. This is an area of Shenandoah National Park, which um, Sadie, this female from East, Eastern Pennsylvania stopped in at least twice. Then um, she also stopped in a pl one place in Columbia three times on, on her, her down and back journeys. And we, we we're preliminarily are looking at stopover sites, but we're gonna be doing a much uh, more in-depth look at habitat uh, and uh, how long they spend it in different sites um, in the near future. So what's next with this research? Well, one of the things we want to really dive in on is, is this migration connectivity. Because some of the populations are declining, but not all of them, we want to see if the, pop if the population areas where birds are notably declining might be wintering in certain areas, maybe in those areas of Brazil where they're deforested. Right now, our data suggests that's not an issue, that, that there's pretty wide overlap for the different populations, but we need to get more data from different areas. Um, and we're going to be analyzing the habitat use data in the very near future now that we have good nesting data from New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. We're going to try to look at that a little bit more. 
Uh, and it, of course, looking at stopover habitat and how trying to evaluate how important that is. And then trying to understand, um, you know, what are the key conservation threats in the different parts of their life cycle. Uh, there are some interesting behaviors that we've discovered that we want to uh, understand more fully. And one of those is what we call pre-migration movements. Uh, we've, we've found at least three of the females that we tagged in, female, in, a, in Pennsylvania did what we call a pre-migration movement where they were nesting here um, throughout the summer. Then as soon as their young fledged and left the nest, the female departs and she leaves the male in charge of teaching the young how to forage and how to find prey. And she goes somewhere completely different. Like this bird went about uh, 50 kilometers up to the Northwest and hung out for a while and then moved around. This bird here went about um, 30 kilometers to the Northwest and hung out for a while. So the, the, they're doing what we call a, almost like taking a, a little vacation before their migration period. And we found this also for the New Hampshire birds. We had three of the New Hampshire birds do a pre-migration movement. And one of them was amazing. Scott Tua Tukataki went all the way from Southern New Hampshire all the way into Quebec for um, a couple of weeks before she started back on our migration south. Monadnock traveled um, 160 miles into Vermont. New, New Benson traveled about 130 miles to New York State. And Scott, I'm butchering the name here, Scott Tutaki traveled over 300 miles into Quebec. So that's a pretty amazing journey. And why would they do that? Why would they leave where they were nesting, go to this completely different place, abandoning their young to the male? Well, what the theory behind this has been proposed for osprey, which do this in Europe, is that the female leaves the nesting territory to allow the, the young the best chance at finding prey, because if she's not there, eating prey, there's gonna be more prey for the young. And that, but it keeps, but the male stays because somebody has to teach the young how to hunt. <clears throat> so in the second year we were tracking Scott Tukati, she also did a, a pre-migration, but to a different place, which is very interesting as well. So we wanna study these new behaviors a little bit more. Um, we've developed some educational materials, which we'd like to try to get out. Um, they are available. This curriculum is on available on our website for teachers, uh, and we've been collaborating with Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative, and they have some really cool information on Audubon website that you can look up that's based on our data. And we have a very active uh, Facebook page, which you can like and get posts. Um, we, we try to do periodic posts updating on the migration, and we've been co collaborating with the Nature Conservancy as well to try to uh, contribute our data to, to their in, uh, information on where uh, birds need to be protected in the Central America corridor. So I'm going to leave it there and open it to questions. I want to thank a lot of the uh, donors which have supported both the work in Pennsylvania, but also the work in, in New Hampshire. I'd like to thank our partners, the Harris Center and VINS and Vermont Institute. Um, and all of our wonderful volunteers that help find nests and monitor nests, we couldn't do this without them. So um, I'd like to thank you all and open it for questions. Thank you, Lori. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was great, very interesting. Uh, we do have several questions for you and I'll start with uh, one from uh, Dan Gardoki, who I mentioned earlier was a, a tracker. He thanks you for being here. Uh, and for your work and dedication. He's curious about how forest pathogens and the decline of certain tree species, such as hemlock and ash, may be impacting broad-winged ecology. Yeah. Um, so our, our studies, I would say, are somewhat preliminary in that we found that them to be somewhat of a generalist in terms of what trees they're using for nesting, but they do like evergreen patches. I think they like the variety of deciduous and evergreen together. So a decline in hemlocks probably would, um, you know, affect, might affect the prey availability that, and that could affect them. The other aspect that can affect them is they are kind of a small hawk. So one of their biggest predators are 
larger raptors like great horned owls and red tailed hawks. And when the forest opens up by when there's, um, you know, kills of, of patches of trees, it can open up and some of these uh, more generalist predators can move in there. Um, so that could be a threat. But I think in general, they'll probably adapt pretty well, um, would be my guess. But except for the then of those kind of landscape changes, which could be a problem. Yeah. Um, in your, you gave that one example of the bird being hesitant to fly over water and doing quite an end run there. Uh, is that fairly typical for broadwing hawks? Yeah, yeah, they are a soaring migrant, so they want to have thermals, and the thermals are going to be much more um, common over land, so they tend to avoid crossing water. And, um, and in that one case, you know, it was pretty dramatic that the bird, you know, as soon as it's got a couple kilometers over the water, turned around and went back. Um, and I actually just heard from some folks in Cape May that put transmitters on young broadwings and uh, in Cape May, New Jersey, which is a peninsula where the birds have to cross the water or travel, you know, 50 miles inland before they go south. And a couple of their birds ended up in the ocean and they tried to cross the water. So uh, it's pretty much, uh, it's, it's very, it's very common for broadwings to avoid water. And that's why they concentrate in, in Veracruz, Mexico, because they're all funneling down through that land corridor through Central America to get to South America. How, how, how many of hawk species are that tied to thermals? Um, yeah, not all of them. I mean, peregrine falcons and uh, harriers and osprey and kites will go across the water and they're pretty well adapted to figure that uh, lift situation out. But most of your soaring birds, like Swainson's hawk, broadwings, red tail hawks, are going to avoid the water. So any bird that likes to soar rather than flap is going to be avoiding water. Uh, peregrine falcons don't seem to mind. Um, and there are strategies for crossing water that can that some of the birds appear to be using. Um, like if they can get up really high and get into a, a stream of air that's going in the direction they want to go, they can get like a little tailwind at the higher altitude that can carry them, you know, right over some water bodies. But broadwings are not really def designed that way. They're more designed to let the air carry them up and up and then glide to the next thermal. So they're very dependent upon thermals. Right. Looking at that picture on the screen, of the white chicks, are all of them white initially? And how long does that last? Um, yes, they're all fluffy white, uh, cute little guys to start. And then they start putting on brown feathers. You can kind of see here, this guy is starting to get some brown here and there. And then uh, you might remember one of the sh photos I had earlier where they were mostly brown. So they, I would say by three weeks or so they start to get more brown feathers and by you know six to eight weeks they're they're pretty feathered out the mm -hmm. last the last feathers they get are the tail feathers but um it, it all happens pretty pretty quickly right we have one question asking about how to what degree you work with eBird either in terms of uh entering inf data into eBird or making use of data that's there? Uh, yes, we use eBird uh, particularly early in, when we're going to somewhere new, like in Vermont um, or Quebec, we look at eBird to see where people have been reporting sightings of broadwings during the nesting season. So that gives us an idea of where we might start looking for nests. Um, so we do use eBird. Um, it hasn't been completely reliable for us at all times, but it is very helpful uh, early in the nesting season to at least give us a tip on possible places to go. And then I used eBird a lot for a, another paper, which I didn't mention here, but uh, we looked at the proportion of, you may remember, as I said, that the three juveniles that we tagged wintered in Central America, whereas all the adults, most of the adults wintered in South America. So it looked like young birds are not migrating as far. So I wanted to look at that in more depth. So I looked at all the eBird data 
from Central and South America and mapped, you know, the young, young birds versus adults to see if that pattern held up. What, what is the, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. What is, what is the lifespan of typically of Broadwing? Um, it's probably about uh, 20 years or so. Um, yeah, we've had, and they do return every year to their nest site. So when they don't come back, we can pretty much assume that they're, you know, they didn't make it. Migration is the time period when birds are most likely to um, undergo some kind of threat and not, maybe not make it. Um, that we have lost some birds during the nesting season to predators. Uh, so all, you know, all through that, there are threats throughout the whole life cycle as with any bird, but um, in migration, you can imagine, especially for a long distance migrant, you have your normal threats like storms and winds and maybe not having enough food and all this, but then you have your abnormal or your new threats such as, uh, you know, climate change bringing more storms or wind turbines or whatever it is. So there's, uh, or shooting, shooting is not, has not gone away in Central America. Are, are there um, <clears throat> plans to track birds that are nesting in Maine? <clears throat> you, um, you, we you have talked, talked about Vermont and New Hampshire, and we feel a little, you know, left <laughs> Yes, um, we are, we like to work with others on this kind of project because we do have to, in order to trap the birds, we have to find nests. So we need people on the ground to help find nests. And then um, you maybe, you know, help a little bit with the expenses. Um, so like in New Hampshire, Phil Brown has a team of volunteers that go out every year and find the nests. Um, and it's not easy. I mean, these birds, as I said, are highly secretive, but if we, if there was a group of volunteers that wanted to try to find a nest, some nests in an area where we could do some trapping, um, like public lands or private lands where they know people, we would definitely want to come to Maine. I, I had talked to somebody about working up around Acadia at one point, but we just never got it organized. So it's on my mind to try to come to Maine at some point. Yeah, well, we'd certainly love to hear about any plans like that. That would be great. I have uh, one final question, which has to do with those, the pictures of the thousands of birds in the sky. Uh, can you describe what it's like attempting to get a count for mm -hmm. those, that kind of sight, sighting? Yeah, um, it's very exciting, of course. Uh, if, if you haven't been to Veracruz, Mexico, or Keckle de Costa Rica, I highly recommend it. It's just, it's a uh, like somebody was comparing it the other day to the wildebeest migration in Africa. You know, it's just this phenomenon when these birds are moving through in such high numbers. Uh, the counting down there though, is not like we're counting them here where we can actually count them individually, even on a 3000 bird day at Hawk Mountain, we can pretty much count each individual bird as it passes over. Down there, you know, the, the flight is so concentrated that what they're, they train their observers to be able to estimate numbers, just like shorebird and waterfowl biologists do at the coast where they get huge flocks, they have to estimate numbers. So um, they take the flock and they say, the broadwing flock, and they'll say, okay, this is what 10 birds look like. And then they just, as the birds are passing over, they go 10, 20. So they're counting them by tens or they're counting them by twenties. So there is an estimation error involved with that. Um, there's been studies that have shown that that error is generally on the downside so that you tend to underestimate more than you tend to overestimate. But, but those numbers you can see on hawkcount.org if you're interested from some of these tropical sites. And it is pretty amazing to, uh, to see that flock. Luckily, I don't have the job of counting them. I just go down and I watch them and let the young guys that are doing the hard work of counting them uh, take care of that business. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight on somewhat short notice. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We loved your program and best of luck with everything you're working on. Well, thank you very much for having me and uh, I'm happy to be here. And yeah, if, you have, if you're interested in any more information, there, Hawk Mountain has a lot of information on our website uh, about the Broadway research. So, so thank and you very best, much. Yeah, and best wishes to everyone zooming in for 
Happy holidays and the new year. And we'll see you in the new year. Thank you and good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.